whatever you think that's interesting or not, but sometimes a battle can do, uh, the outcome can dramatically change the entire course of history, like Antietam did for the Civil War, leading to the Emancipation Proclamation. You know, dramatically change the entire course of history. Tannenberg and Warren, it's hard to find one bigger, hard to. And so with that, um, we got the uh, trench warfare, stalemate. Oh, what was it called where both sides tried to outflank each other? This is off land. Race to the sea. Yeah, race to the sea. And did you get how many men died in 1914 just on the Western Front? Yeah, and that number died on the Eastern Front, too. This is just the beginning. That's why they had to dig in. You dig in, at least you have a little bit of protection. As awful as the trenches are, at least there's a chance. So, 1914, a couple things came real fast. First off, both sides decided that if uh, we didn't win the big battle, we fought. They're going to widen the war, find someplace else to attack. And it happened almost immediately, less than a month into the war. Less than a month into the war, Britain and France started attacking German colonies in Africa, in the Cameroons, in Togo. And eventually, they would take them all, uh, a small force in um, German East Africa, today it's uh, Tanganyika, uh, or Tanzania. Tanganyika would be the colony officer, but they did not surrender there, the German forces there, until 1919. They didn't know the war was over. <laughs> no, there. And another way they tried to widen the war was getting allies. Japan entered the war on the side of their allies, the British. So Japan fought on their side. They took, for example, the German possessions in Tingzhou and a bunch of islands, like the Marshalls, the, the Marianas. Uh, Tinian, Saipan, any we talk, Kwajalein. I'm only mentioning those because those are islands that thousands of American Marines and soldiers would die taking in World War II. Remember what I told you, World War II in the Pacific where it was a big war for empire. The Ottoman Empire. The British, I'm sorry, the Germans made all sorts of promises to the Ottoman Empire. They promised them big hunks of Russia and even um, parts of Persia, which is now Iran. They promised all this stuff, get Egypt back, and the Ottomans entered on the side of the Axis. So the war is widening. In 1915, two more allies. Ooh, what happened here? Oh, let's do this. <laughs> Italy. The Allies promised Italy massive parts of not only Austria, but also the Ottoman Empire. And Italy joined the side of the Allies. And Bulgaria, still upset at Serbia, joined the side of the Germans. And that would be it for Germany. The so-called Central Powers, Germany, Austria, Bulgaria, and the Ottoman Empire. Eventually, most of the rest of the world would be against them. Do you want a little swoosh thing? Yes. Okay. So, strategy. Germany quickly realized, you know, going into 1915, that they don't have enough men to win on both sides. And so what they decided is this. Dig in. Hold out in the West. Dig the elaborate trenches, much more elaborate than the Western Allies did. Take the high ground, hold out. If you dig more elaborate defenses, you don't need as many men to defend, and that will allow them to knock Russia out. They thought they could win a couple of victories, get Russia to pull back here, and then drop out of the war. But they also decided, remember Serbia? Serbia! We better take care of Serbia. The Austrians tried in August of 1914 and were routed by the smaller Serbian army. <clears throat> but Germany now would join, and that's why they got Bulgaria. You notice how it's surrounded, Serbia. And Serbia would be defeated in 1915. Technically, they never quit, and they would stay on the side of the Allies, but poor Serbia would go through absolute hell in this war. And then hell in World War II. 
and in the 1990s, this area is going to go through a lot. In the, the West, the Allies, the Allies got a lot of problems. France wants to drive Britain out, or drive, which is stupid to attack your ally. France wants to drive Germany out, but Britain doesn't have an army. So they got to wait. Yeah. So is it just basically Germany against everybody? Mm -hmm. So it's Germany's kind of the view of this situation. The what? View. <laughs> <laughs> We're not all against Butte. Do you have t-shirts that they sell that say Butte versus everybody? Huh? <laughs> Butte's just, just sad now. <laughs> it's just a big ghost town. But Britain had to build an army. And so that means they have trained, equipped, you need officers, sergeants. It's going to take a year. This is one of the great secrets of the war. The Allies implied in 1915 we'll drive them out and the boys will be home by Christmas. They really weren't going to be ready for 1916. And so the war is going to go on and on. So the France, the French are going to try. The Germans, or the British will try some offenses, but they also knew it. The Russians. The Russians needed weapons. Their manufacturing was so ill equipped, it's going to take another year before they're going to have enough bullets and ammunition. And with the Ottoman Empire, as you can see by this map, they blocked off really the only route into Russia. Can't go this way. Ice and one rickety railroad coming from the west. So, yes, the British will try to take this, and that will be a disaster. I should add, if Russia and Turkey look like they might be going to war now. And I wonder if they're going to block that off. This is a we we have. This is so exciting. Are Russia and Turkey like kind of friends? Like. When I pulled out of Syria, did they both? Not now. A Syrian Russian airstrike killed over 30 Turks. But like three months ago, weren't Russian and Turkey buddies? Not really buddies, but a, a, it was more of convenience. But they've never liked each other. Yeah, ever. My enemies, my friends. Yeah, and they've never liked each other. It's bad. Yeah. Oh, I was just going to ask if it was like during World War I or not. And so with that, both sides, the Allies begin to look for ways to pinprick on the periphery, find ways to attack on the periphery. Maybe they could knock out the Ottomans. Maybe if they could, you know, get in this weak underbelly of Austria, which is not weak. They thought all kinds of things they could try. Heck, both sides tried to intrigue in Afghanistan. We brought no consequences down the road. It's just amazing how many things will come out of this. So. On the Russian front, the Russians and the Austrians would combine. Is that disconcerting? Do you like it? Do you like it? I'm not allowed in it. Sound effect, right? At a really complicated but a brilliant military coup right here at a battle called Tarno and Gorlice. It's two towns, so it's called together. The Russian army was destroyed, the entire army by combined German and Austrian attack. This victory was so complete that the Russians pulled back all the way to here by the end of 1915. We're talking thousands of square miles, a devastating defeat. Almost all of what is now Poland, a big hunk of Belarus, Lithuania, Ukraine. This is a huge victory. In fact, the Germans and Austrians could have kept pushing. They just didn't have enough men. And they just assumed Russia would fail. That Russia would sue for peace, terrify the Allies. But Russia stayed in. Which, of course, some of you have already know, this will end the Russian Empire pretty soon. And so, even with that, you're going to have multiple fronts. Here, 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 here. here. <laughs> And with more men than ever before fighting, they can hold an entire line. Even in the east, over thousands more miles, they dug in and held long lines. Before, remember the Civil War, the armies being camp and they go meet and fight a battle. That's the way wars were. Not now. And they came up with a word for this. The idea was to be like on a frontier between two countries. So they called it a front. And meteorology was brand new. You can imagine how important predicting the weather would be in war. You don't want to attack in a monsoon, let's say. And so, 
meteorology would take the terms of the war to to uh, predicting the weather. What do you call when a cold air mass runs into a hot air mass? What do you call that line? That's up front. And it comes from World War One. Kind of makes sense. The term applies, but I said I asked that the first person, the first response somebody said, tornadoes. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that how tornadoes are made? Yeah, but but that'd be we'd have with just a line of tornadoes coming. <laughs> like when the cold front came in Saturday night, line of tornadoes. I gotta admit, I enjoyed it immensely. It's very fun. So one of the new fronts, the Italian front. We already got the Russian front, the Italian front in 1915. And this would be fighting here, and the thing was it was fighting at 14,000 feet. They're in the middle of the Julian Alps, this incredible array of high peaks. <coughs> Plunging valleys, incredibly difficult to fight. In fact, they just found four Italian soldiers who were frozen to death uh, three months ago. What? Who had fought in this back fought here. Well, they find bodies all the time, but four together, perfectly preserved, who had died. Probably what happened is they're in a shelter, they collapsed, they suffocated. That happens. They, they find people all the time. So. But that one was just so the body was just like perfectly preserved, the uniforms were preserved. How did they fight people? Did they just go out and look? No, they not anymore. Just doing other things and just happened to find them, but probably something where uh, really snow was receding. Um, and so that's where they found it. Almost certainly. And with that, the Italians did not break through. They would lose hundreds of thousands of men for Italy. And the men were poorly led. E, they would execute men for even for just made up excuses of cowardice just to show examples. This wartime experience for Italy would lead directly to fascism in Italy. Directly. But more the point is we gotta get more sailed. More sailed. Other fronts. Well, there's gonna be a Balkan front then right here, but there's gonna be a lot of the Ottoman Empire. Do not. Write these down unless you just run it off. Well, I won't test you. I just wanted to give you an idea how it was. So we have a Palestinian front right here. We have a Mesopotamian front right here. And a Caucasus front right here. Three big fronts. The Italian or the British just assumed and the Russians that the Ottoman Empire would crumble. They didn't. They fought much better than anyone thought. They held out. And this would turn out to be bloody, awful fight here. In fact, the British lost when they first attacked here. And uh, yes, they would carve these three Ottoman provinces into a country called Iraq. But one of the babies you do have to give was, through British and French aid, mostly British, the Arab population of the Ottoman Empire. So the Arab population is basically in all these areas here are mostly majority Arab. You know, the Ottomans are here, and we have Kurds, Armenians, but the Arabs revolted, and the British helped them. And this is what we got to get. They were promised independent countries. You revolt and knock the Ottomans out, you will get independence. Some kind of Arab states. Now, we can't go into all the detail of them, but let's just put it this way. Does anybody believe that the British and French were telling the truth when they said this? They immediately went behind. No way! Yeah, the British lied through their teeth, and they were going to colonize it. The British were going to use Arabs to try to defeat the Ottomans by turning this to a big guerrilla war, and then the British and the French were going to colonize it. This will have no consequences down the road. Nothing to see here. Move on. This is going to be a disaster. And it's a pretty amazing the countries they created are, there's no coincidence. What's happened in Palestine, which is now Israel, and never solving that. Syria, created for the French, which is now going through absolute hell, and then Iraq. No coincidence. And so with that, yeah. Why is there not in French? I just I like the arrows, so I took it. I like the colors. There was a couple in English, but they weren't as good. Okay. I used them. And then another place called Gallipoli. In 1915, the British had a great idea. Hey, what if we attack in this little strait right here? Open it up, and that would knock the Ottomans out. We take their capital of Constantinople, Istanbul, 
and open up the spy rock to Russians. This would open up a, a way to attack from a different uh, front here, or maybe up through here. I get Romania in the war on our side. And so they invaded. And this would turn out to be an absolute disaster for the British and French and their colonies when they attacked. They had no idea what they were attacking. This is a map. This is a real big deal at this time. They would make these realistic maps. I like them. But here's the water going to Constantinople. Here's Gallipoli. See this finger of land? And that picture should tell you the problem. You see it? How rugged of terrain it is? And they attacked in these mountains and were bogged down, and it was a slaughter. Hundreds of thousands of British, French, but also Australian and New Zealand. They were going on their way to Europe. They went through the Suez Canal. Australian and New Zealand troops were in Egypt. And it was like, well, we've got these troops here. Let's use them. And so they would fight. And here are Australians going to attack. Yes, it was bogged down to trench warfare. This gives you an idea how rugged it is, a place called Suba Bay. Thousands would die here. And the British would pull out in absolute humiliation. But one, two things I'll tell you about this, which is pretty amazing. Out of this, this would be the, the uh, foundation of two countries, Gallipoli. Two countries would come out of this. Gallipoli would be, in many ways, that moment that created them. One country was the modern Turkey. After the war, when the Ottoman Empire collapsed, Gallipoli was something they could hold on to. We held on. The Turks held there. We could make a Turkish state. Anybody know the other country? Australia. This is the foundation of modern Australia. Australia were independent, were colonies on the island of Australia, the massive island of Australia, but colonies on there. And this was a unifying principle for Australia. Thousands of Australians every year to this day make the pilgrimage to, to Gallipoli. It's, it's kind of created, well, it did, it created the state. Yeah. It's a little like what happened in Georgia, same thing, but they were debtors. Yeah, it was a debtor's place. Like, like, oh, really? That's, I know a lot, they would send a lot of political prisoners there. For example, those who rebelled in Ireland, they sent them yeah. to Australia. Tasmania. So remember I mentioned Thomas Francis Marr, who did, yeah, he was sent to Tasmania and escaped. But the first ones, went, most of them were debtors, but there were a few that were, instead of killing them, we'll, we'll uh, ship them off to some little isolated cabin in Tasmania. But that's pretty interesting. That, that'd be a cool thing to get. And so with that, where the war was going to be fought, then was the Western Front. The Western Front would be the hinge of the war. Both sides had to win there. This is where the United States would get involved. Here are French soldiers in 1914. I still don't know. Is that a ditch, like an irrigation ditch, or is that a trench? Yes. And the answer is yes. And by the way, if it rained in a trench, that's what it was like. Fill up with water, and then the water table is so high there that it takes a long time for this. I'm not, we're not, they're not in Montana. Okay. So <laughs> what we have is trench war. And this is a battle of attrition. And both sides quickly adopted it. Remember attrition, we talked about this in the Civil War. It's kill so many of the enemy, grind them down, leave them white, is something they would say. And so this is a very generic picture. I mentioned no man's land back at Petersburg trenches. But we have the front line trench, support trenches, communication trenches. And so this generically is supposed to be the shell hole. It's a pretty good little diagram, but this one is pretty amazing. That is a real shot over France near the Somme. And these are, there's a British and German trenches. And which one is British? The Allies did not have as elaborate trenches, partially because they wanted their men to get out and drive the Germans out. Remember the Germans dig in, hold out. Much more elaborate, uh, deeper, they had dugouts buried in, way under the lines so make it huddle during uh, long artillery attacks. So when I was in Belgium in 2001, 
they literally had just found four German soldiers. And same deal, they're actually digging under a, for a roadbed, and they were entombed in one of their bomb rooms. So I'm guessing that's what happened to the Italian one, too. They had been entombed, and they suffocated. The shelling, they couldn't get to them, collapsed, and they died. And they found the bodies mummified down there. In a what? In a shelter. Oh. They called them bomb rooms, put about 20 feet below, so they could huddle on there, and it must, the entrance must have collapsed. And they find bodies, shells, all the time. Anywhere from 30 to 50 Belgian civilians are killed or wounded every year because of unexploded shells from World War I. And you see that you notice the trench line is not uh, straight? Pretty good reason why, I bet you can probably guess. That's one reason. So if, you get, if the enemy takes a trench and it's straight, can they just fire straight down the line? The other reason is, if a shell hits, and let's say it does hit that direct shot on the trench line, if the trench line is jagged, it only affects that one section. And so you see in movies, a lot of times they'll show the straight trench line. They're, they're kind of rounded. And even this one, you really can see it. And then the other reason is, if it's jagged, if you need to put a lot of men in the line, if it's jagged, that means longer trench, more people. But no man's land would be strong with barbed wire. Remember that great new invention? They would shell it with high explosives. Every, every square inch would be measured out for machine guns and heavy artillery. So men would go into no man's land in the night for scouting, but also to put up more barbed wire and that kind of thing. Landmines, they were just starting to invent, but they were not very reliable. They had a bad habit of blowing up just randomly. And so, did you have a question? I was just wondering, like, who goes out and call the barbed wire up? I know. Just like, they just go out and sneak out for the duck? And engineers called sappers, but yeah. And they're, uh, nobody wants to do it for obvious reasons. Every once in a while, they would go over the top and attack the enemy, and that's where you have the bloodiest time, because when you emerge from that, well, I think you can imagine. And getting hung up on the barbed wire would be absolute hell on earth, and this would lead to stay on my trench, then, would be, your trench would have to be deep, had to be protected, and here is a shot of a British trench. You see a little bit of a curve, but that's a 1918 after the Germans took it, with some bodies there, and a lot of times the bodies can be buried or they be buried under dirt, and then when they're improving the trenches, the part would collapse, bodies would collapse into it. You can imagine every time it rained, it would be full of water. These are Germans getting ready to uh, attack. That's 1918. That's a British uh, soldier. That's an Australian at Gallipoli putting his hat up. Remember I showed you that picture from the Civil War, Civil War where they put the hat up? Or, yeah. And look at the wet. If it rains, especially in Belgium, where it's clay soil, but also the water table is really high, it can stay like this for months. And can you imagine what that's going to do if your feet are in water, especially in cold water, all the time? In fact, the name for it came out of World War I. What is it called? Trench foot. So you know when you take a bath, get wrinkled. You know why you get wrinkled? Your skin's absorbent. And so it, it soaks in there. Part of the reason is your blood doesn't flow because it's you know, you're just, water's, water's kind of uh, pushed it out, and it's not a big deal. You know, you know, look, and imagine doing that for two weeks. The skin begins to die because it's not getting blood. And not only is that bad when the skin begins to die, but what the big thing is there's fungus all over. The fungus gets into your skin, and you take your shoes off, and that happens. And it hurts really, really bad. I just want to make that clear. In fact, if you know anything about the military today and all armies of the world, the number one thing, keep your feet dry. You want to be disciplined if you're in the military, you have wet feet. Because of this. You can't fight if you're like that. And I don't know how you keep dry. And so here, what are they doing? Those are Germans. Picking out lice eggs. They go in the trench and just cover with them. You can see them hopping off you. You get off the line, get away from lice a little bit. As soon as you get on, covered with lice. Aren't lice attracted to clean hands? It's a number of people, but they couldn't keep clean. Can't keep clean on the trench, so. But I thought that lice, like, likes clean your hair than dirty your hair. But they like food. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I like food. And here, 
Rat Honey became a sport. Those are French soldiers. But look at that thing. Look at that. That's like a 25 pound rat. Okay, I'm exaggerating. So when I was a little kid, there was a federal war, World War One lived next to us, and I remember asking him, okay, as a little kid, so he asked stupid questions. Like, Did you shoot anybody? Not a good question to ask, but he was, you know, he understood. He goes, no, nope, only rats. I didn't mind the Germans. I hated the rats. I'll never forget that. Did you shoot anybody? Huh? Did you shoot anybody? I don't know. <laughs> All he told me is he shot rats. And he very appropriately decided this is not a thing to tell like a four or five year old. <laughs> so that's in Belgium. And these trenches are still there today, a lot of them, especially when they're dug into the limestone. And this is an in, that's into a tunnel. And both sides did tunnels underneath and try to blow up the enemy lines. And the Seeds Ridge in Belgium, the British basically blew off and blew up an entire mountain. It's just gone now. And you could go into there, but when I was there, they had hoof and mouth. That's the teaching with that is indeed for cattle. And they were trying to control it so they wouldn't let people walk around. So I, I took this through a barbed wire fence. And so I was really sad. And I didn't catch up in my theater. I wouldn't have fun. But I guess spelunkers, is that right? Spelunking? They go into these caves. I guess it's really fun to do, especially if you like bats. I, I think bats are great animals. I think they're good. I, I don't want to see them. Sorry, bats. Okay, they're not all bad, but prime rats. <laughs> so, here's going over the top. These are British soldiers going over. Those, that, those are Americans. These are British. See what he's doing? I just love that. He's going over the top. I mean, very well, going to get shot, but he's going, yeah, to the Germans. I just think yeah. that's hilarious. <laughs> and something, right? What else are you going to do? So, some of the weapons really fast. Machine guns, people talk about these. A lot. You can imagine how the men hated machine guns. They could spray bullets out four to five hundred rounds a minute. This is a German 30 caliber. It's water cooled. See the little hose there. Water goes in to keep the barrel from getting too hot. This is a an American firing a French machine gun that jammed all the time called Lewis gun. Uh, these are Austrians firing their machine guns. And the machine guns, you don't aim. You just spray bullets out. Just spray bullets. And the whole idea is they got to make them go through. And you can imagine how the men, well, let's put it this way. Machine gunners were never dangerous. Did you get my point there? So they would keep firing, and then all of a sudden their position about ready to be over, overrun. They'd surrender. And you just mow down my friends. No. Snipers either. Wouldn't take snipers. Snipers aren't taking prisoners either. You can imagine it's not a love loss for them. For them. But machine guns would also lead to other ways to get to avoid that between no man's land. So there's a fight with a machine gun, I gotta admit, that's pretty funny. Here's another one of those shields you'd push along and fire behind. Here's a dog bomb, so they can. So I'm always fascinated when you know, humans dying, people are like, oh yeah, people die, whatever. Dog, oh! <laughs> I do have more sympathy for dogs in a way. I guess people are ordered, but the dogs really don't know. And they're so trusting. Here's a rat bomb. And that's a real attempt. We're not going to go into how they got the bomb into the rat. But, but look at this picture. So this shows medieval with modern. A German soldier, modern rifle, gas mask, and a lance. <laughs> But artillery is the killer. Heavy artillery, and so those are 255 millimeter shell. So yeah, it doesn't look like your stereotypical German. Let's go down the sausage. Okay, and they call these trench mortars, but they would fire it, and they sometimes call them trench mines. But they would plunge shells down. Some huge, heavy shells. These are British soldiers putting up shells. You know, the Americans going to be in this too. Artillery is the big killer. But a couple new weapons they tried, flamethrowers. And flamethrowers, the big thing is, if you shoot at an enemy position, they, people duck if a jet of gasoline is coming at you, that's funny. And these specially trained men, first the Germans were first, they're German flamethrowers. 
they really had an effect on offenses, but I think you can see the problem with it. You're running around with a can of jelly and gasoline on your back. Let's just put it this way. The attrition rate amongst flamethrower crews is pretty high. Here are French flamethrowers. But it shoot basically jelly gasoline, get high pressure, shoot it out, and right in the, in the front of it, have like a, basically an, an ignition with a spark and shoot on it. Oh, you have a lighter and <laughs> Try that next time. <laughs> Trench jam. What's it, Christian? Kill some of the enemy. They basically run out of men. So attrition means these guys, a lot of them die fast. And that's a problem. These specially trained men are the ones at the front. And they, they're the ones who kill the wounded first. They also, what's this? They tank with the meaningless code name that the British gave this weapon. They imply that we're going to bring water up to the men in front. So a water tank. Thus, tank. Because you think about it, what does tank even mean? I mean, no, you, but tank, wait, that doesn't make sense. The British thought, hey, why not a land battleship? <laughs> and it could propel its own power, go over the trenches. Now, they never had strong enough engines. They broke down all the time. This is a Mark VI tank that would roll around, at, roll along at an average speed of about three miles an hour. That's what? And, yeah. And the thought was it could go over no man's land, go over the trenches. That's why it's got that weird kind of cough, lot, cough drop shape. And the men could follow it, but they were claustrophobic. Even at three miles an hour, they had no suspension, and the men would be standing it. They get seasick. The equivalent of it, they throw up. How do you turn a tank like this? There's no steering wheel. There's two engines that smoke and sometimes they die of carbon monoxide inside the tank. But you have one man standing like this with a with a, a lever, and another man over here. The commander would look out the window and say, turn right! And the guy on the right would do what? Hit the brake. That tread would stop. And the other guy would go forward. Oh. Yeah. That's how they would turn. And if the guy fell down, they would, it was just a disaster. The Germans never would commit a lot of resources. They made a, a few of them, but they, these behemoths didn't move. They broke down. <laughs> they only built a couple dozen. The French built lighter tanks. These are Americans in a French Renault tank. And that's kind of the beginning of more of a modern tank with a turret. The tanks did have an effect, but it's more of a precursor to what's coming. A precursor to what's coming. Another weapon that's pretty important we have to get to, oh, the Tsar tank. No, I just put this up there because it's just the most amazing thing. The Russians tried to build this massive wheel that could just go over trenches. And this is what, so that's them. They only built a couple of them. One survived and it's in a museum and look how big this thing is. Look at the armored car. Now look at that. And I know what you're thinking. We should get one for the class. Yes. I so badly want to go there. And just, I want to stand here. Okay, so I know then it'd be over. But still, also airplanes, another massive technological feat. The first planes were used for reconnaissance, and this would change everything. So much of camouflage was going to come out of the fact that well, they could see us, we better hide. Before, it didn't really happen. Yes, both sides used balloons, but that's another story. But you can see what's coming, you can just imagine what's going to come out of that. First off, if they're flying reconnaissance, you want to keep those reconnaissance planes out of, out of the way. So shoot out, development of fighter planes. And, oh, there's a bunch of enemy. What if we drop bombs? The beginning of bombs. And both of them will come out of that. In fact, when the first French and German planes flew next to each other on reconnaissance missions, they would just salute each other. Then eventually someone starts shooting at them, and yes, you can see where that's going to go. Well, these are, by 1917, there would be thousands of these. Fighter planes are right here. There are biplanes because the engines are so small. Two wings give you more lift, slows you down, more drag. This is even a tri-wing. And this is the kind of plane that the Red Baron, Baron von Richthofen, flew. Because the battle was so stalemated, they started looking at fighter pilots as sort of like heroes, because it was like the knights of the sky. And they would, would rom romanticize that. So the Germans started really doing it first. 
And so they came up with the idea that if you shoot down five enemy planes, you are a superior fighter plane. What do they call them? Ace. Yeah, that's where the ace comes from. Five planes, which most never shoot down any. And so that's a big deal. He shot down eight. In World War II, the Germans had an ace that shot down over 200. Hmm? Uh, ba, ba, ba. Ulrich, and I can't remember his first name, and he died in 44. Mostly Russian planes, but yeah. The American leading ace, we had a couple guys shoot over 60. World War One, Eddie Rickenbacker was the American one. That's a French fad, but it's under, but, but it's used by the Americans. That's a British Southwest Camel. That's what Snoopy flew. And this is probably the best plane of the war. The company's name is Fokker, so it's a Fokker D7, and that's a Fokker DR1. And I think you might see one of the problems with them. What's a plane like this made out of? Too heavy. Balsa wood, as light wood as possible, and then it's cloth. And so these planes, you can sew them. And so they look like a quilt. If they're actually in combat, they have like patches all over. And if they're balsa wood, where do you put a machine gun? Only place to put it is over the engine. Only place to in them. So you're firing through the through the propeller. You see an issue. You shoot through the propeller and then land really fast. So with that, the French put steel plates on the inside of the propeller. <coughs> And so the bullets would ricochet off the steel plates. I think you might see a problem with that. Bang! It'd be the Germans who come up with a timing mechanism to, to attach the machine gun to the engine. So when the propeller came up, it would not fire for that split second. So it could fire through the propellers. And then pretty soon everyone copied that. And as soon as they came up with that big technological achievement, all of a sudden you're going to have fighter planes surviving, the pilots lasting longer, and they'll go from one or two planes fighting to thousands of planes in the air. We'll come to bombers in just a sec. I like World War One fighter planes. I like World War fighter planes too. But even with all these inventions, stalemate persisted. Even a Russian map could not help both sides. The Western Front, the Russian Front. When the Romanians entered, the Romanian Front, the Bul stalemate. And that's with both sides. We've already talked about this. How do we get out of this war? Break the enemy's will. Erich von Ludendorff was, well, we'll come back to him, but one of the most prominent German generals. He's ch uh, chief of the German general staff. He was the brains behind the German war effort. And he would coin a term, and this implies that the Germans are destroying a French city right here. What term did he coin? We talked about this in the Civil War. It didn't have a name yet. Sherman's March to the Sea. He's the one who coined the term total war. Total war. We can't win on the battlefield, and the Germans don't have enough people. Look at how many people the Russians have, the French have, the British have, and soon the Americans, the Italians. So, it's a twofold effort. The entire economy has got to be mobilized to war. I know that we already talked about that mobilization, but now we really mean everything from all production must be geared for the war. Food, transportation, everything geared for the war. But if you do it, so is your enemy. Tomorrow, we fight the war after I hand back the DBQ. I was going to hand it back earlier.